Hello, I'm Gregory Davis, gynecologist in Chico, California. Thank you for joining me. What I thought we would do is talk about incontinence. If you're like a lot of my patients, you have some questions related to what type of incontinence people have, what, how do you diagnose it, how do you treat it. So what we're going to do is kind of go through that be in two stages. First of all, I'm going to talk about how we diagnose it, and then in the second stage, we'll talk about how we treat it. So let's take a look here and see. When we have incontinence as our subject, there's two types of incontinence. There's what we call stress urinary incontinence. Stress refers to coughing, laughing, sneezing, exercise, running, and those kinds of things. OAB stands for overactive bladder. Now, when we talk about overactive bladder, there's multiple different things that can cause overactive bladder. So it's kind of an umbrella, and I look at it and I say, okay, one of the things that can cause overactive bladder is a urinary tract infection. So when you get an infection and you go to your doctor before you get there and get a urinalysis, you know you have some urgency, you have some frequency, and you may even have some pain. So once you get a urinalysis, it comes back and shows you have some bacteria. Well, then we've diagnosed a urinary tract infection. But until you get that diagnosis, technically you have what we call an overactive bladder. Well, what about kidney stones? If somebody has kidney stones, as those stones are coming from the kidneys down through what we call the ureters down to the bladder, once that stone hits the bladder, it's very irritating. If you can see those under a microscope, they've just got all these little points on them, and they're just, they just look painful, and they are painful. So as that is kind of bouncing around inside the bladder until you actually excrete that, believe me, that can trigger some spasms in your bladder. And so that's another cause for overactive bladder. Now, what about somebody that's had prior surgery? So if you're one of those people that's had in surgery for incontinence in the past, well, you may have had some scar tissue or from where they put the sutures or where they did the kind of the dissection at your surgery. That may have irritated the bottom of your bladder and that scar tissue that's still there continues on a daily basis to irritate your bladder and may cause some overactive bladder symptoms. And we'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. So prior bladder surgery. Now the other one is, is low estrogen. And this one may be a surprise to you. But if we look at the anatomy of the bladder, and if we, if we take a look, and I've got a sample of the bladder right here. If we take a look at the bladder and we cut it in half, you can see there's the red part of the bladder, that's what we call the trigun. That's the floor of the bladder, and that's an estrogen dependent part of the bladder. So that's the only part of the bladder that needs to have estrogen to be healthy. You can see the urethra, the bottom part of the, of the uh, uh, tube here that you void through, that is also estrogen dependent. So if you don't have enough estrogen, and you started to go through the menopause, or you've stopped your estrogen that you've been on, you're going to get some symptoms in overactive bladder. You're going to get some irritation. You're going to get that urge to go and have some frequency. Now, the final one is what we call IC or interstitial cystitis. Interstitial cystitis is where you have symptoms of either pain, you can have urgency, and you can have frequency. I encourage you to go on our website or onto our YouTube videos, and we have one, a whole uh, video on interstitial cystitis. I encourage you to take a look at that in, in depth because we kind of go over that in, in, in a lot of detail. So, when we look at the two types, you have overactive bladder and you have stress incontinence. Now, so when, you, when somebody comes to me and they say, well, I have incontinence, first question I'm going to ask is, well, are you leaking when you cough, laugh, or sneeze? Well, if you are, then of course we're starting to think about stress incontinence. I'll also ask, how about exercise? How about when you jump up out of a chair to go do something? Well, if you're leaking like that, what that's telling me is that your bladder is starting to kind of drop. If, if you think about it, if you're looking, kind of uh, visualize like you're looking at somebody cross-section. So here's your pubic bone, and here's your urethra, and here's my bladder. So what happens is that the four ladies have kids, their urethra and their bladder are being held up. So they're being held up in a normal position. What happens is that as babies come down through the birth canal, that tissue, that fascia, the tough layer that holds the bladder and the urethra up kind of get torn away from the pelvis, so they start to drop a little bit. So as that bladder starts to drop and the urethra starts to drop, 
Now, all of a sudden, this area between the bladder and the urethra is called the bladder neck. As that drops down, now all of a sudden it's starting to get into the pelvis. And the pelvis, the muscles in there generate more pressure than you do in your abdomen. So up here when you cough, you're generating pressure in the abdomen, but the urethra is so tight you don't leak urine. But when it drops down into the pelvis, now the bladder and the urethra are on the same level. They're both in the pelvis. And when you cough, they're both getting the same pressure. you got big bladder, little urethra, what's going to happen? You're going to leak urine. So stress incontinence is usually related to the bladder dropping down. So as that bladder drops down, what are we going to do to correct that? Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's going to be a surgery to kind of lift that back up. So doing an exam is one of the ways I'll check and see when I'm doing a pelvic exam to see if that bladder is dropping down. The other thing is with stress incontinence is that if we look at the urethra, so we look at the little tube that you're voiding through, that's like a pipe. Think of it as a pipe. The bottom half of the pipe is estrogen dependent. So those cells, when they have enough estrogen in those tissues, when you cough, the whole, you, the whole tube closes and you don't leak urine. But when you don't have enough estrogen and the floor of that pipe is thin and you cough, those cells can't completely come together, so you've got a small opening. So what's going to happen? When you cough, some urine is going to start to squirt and kind of leak out. So just having some low estrogen may also trigger you to have a, a type of stress incontinence. Well, that's kind of an easy thing to take care of. If you start on your, go back on your estrogen, or if you're not on it and you start on some estrogen, then those tissues become nice and healthy and plump, and that will take away some of that stress incontinence. So that's one of the easy things. Now. For overactive bladder, the history I usually get from patients is that they have this urge to go, they, they know where all the bathrooms are at work, they know where all the bathrooms are at school, you know, they, they are constantly on the lookout for a bathroom. They're the kind of people that can't sit through a movie because they've got to go. They, have, they know where the pause button is on their remote because they can't sit through the movie. They're the kind of people that also will notice when they have that urge to go if they don't get to the bathroom on time, they may actually leak before they get there. So they also have what we call urinary frequency. If you ask them how many times a day they go, time from the time they wake up till bedtime, it may be over 10 times, sometimes more. I've got one patient who, uh, well, she has IC, but she's going over 30 times a day when she flares up. So obviously her life revolves around the bathroom. So overactive bladder, urgency, frequency, and sometimes they can have some pain. Now, we can do a urinalysis and check and see if the urine has bacteria in there, got some white blood cells, and we grow a culture and it grows out some bacteria, then yes, you've got a bladder infection that we're going to need to treat that. Kidney stones, typically you'll have some pain that starts up in your flanks and then it kind of radiates around to the front and then it kind of goes down to your inguinal area, kind of down to your groin, and then it goes into your bladder, and then you start to get that urgency and frequency. The other thing you'll have is that if we do a urinalysis, there won't be any bacteria, there won't be any white blood cells, but there's going to be some blood. So if you see some blood and you have an associated pain and it started up high, we start thinking of kidney stones. Prior surgery, as we mentioned, if you've had prior bladder surgery, that when you look at the, blad the urethra, bladder surgery involves putting something underneath to lift this back up. So there's, there's incisions made in the vagina underneath the urethra. So any time we do any kind of dissection underneath the urethra and right under the floor of the bladder, that, those tissues are very delicate. And, and when, you're dice, when I'm dissecting and, and, and moving that tissue, getting it ready to put in a sling or to put in some sutures or some tissue to hold that up, when that heals, that can cause some scarring and there's a constant irritation there. That constant irritation sends signals to the floor of the bladder, which then signals to the brain. The brain then sends signals you've got to go to the bathroom. So an overactive bladder may come about from prior surgery. That, if you are going to have bladder surgery, and I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here, but let's assume you have some stress incontinence, and you go to see somebody and they talk about doing surgery to lift that bladder neck up. The success of surgery for stress incontinence is about... 85 percent. So you're going to have, if you have surgery and lift that up, you're going to have about an 85 percent success rate. So that means you're not going to leak with coughing and laughing and sneezing. Interesting thing is though, 
what are the side effects from having that surgery? Well, the side effects are, it could be anywhere from 15 to 25%, you may, have, we may cause you to have some bladder spasms. So we've corrected the stress incontinence, and now we've created another problem. So it's real important if you're contemplating having surgery, that you go to a surgeon that does lots of bladder surgery, somebody that's very experienced, and somebody that's willing to talk to you on your consent form, and on the consent form, they're gonna be telling you your success rate, a high 85% for most surgeries. Side effects, you may have some bladder and you may have some bladder spasms for which you're gonna need treatment afterwards. So it's interesting because I'll have patients come in to see me and they'll say, well, my surgery wasn't a success. It was a failure. I don't want to have any more surgery. And so I'll ask them, so you had surgery for coughing, laughing, and sneezing. And they, they say, yes. I say, do you leak when you cough or laugh or sneeze? Oh, no, I don't, I don't leak anymore. And I go, well, that's why you had the surgery. And they go, that's right. Well, I said, well, then it was successful. And they go, but I'm still leaking. And I go, okay, so when you hurry to get to the bathroom, you leak before you get there. And they go, yes. And I wake up at nighttime sometimes. I can't make it to the bathroom. Well, what's happening is that their surgery was a success from the stress point of view, but they had, unfortunately, one of the side effects is that they got an overactive bladder. So it's real important, if you're going to sign a consent and you're contemplating surgery, that you understand there are risks associated with that. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have the surgery, but it just means you need to know that going into the surgery. Now, so with stress incontinence, how do we diagnose that? Diagnosing stress incontinence is, first of all, your history. Well, leaking when you cough or laugh or sneeze. The other thing is having to wear protection. So if you're wearing a panty liner or having to wear pads and you're changing that frequently, well, obviously, I think that's a pretty significant thing. The second thing is, is that I do a pelvic exam. And on the pelvic exam, I'm looking to see what's the estrogen status in the tissues. And then as I look in the vagina, what I'm looking for is that if I, I think of your vagina as a tube, and, and the bladder sits on the front. So if, if your bladder is dropping down, we call that a cystocele. And a cystocele, if you've had kids, just having a grade one is normal. If, you've, if you have a grade two, it comes to the opening of grade three, the bladder starts to come out. So the first thing I'm doing then is, is looking in the vagina to see, do you have some sort of a prolapse of that bladder coming down? I also take a look and see if the back of the vagina, if the rectum's bulging down, and we call that a rectocele. And then I take a look at the top of the vagina to see if the uterus is dropping down because that can sometimes happen. So with childbirth, you can have prolapse not only of the bladder, but of the rectum and of the uterus. So another thing, if you have stress incontinence and you're, you're contemplating having surgery, it's really important that your surgeon, when they do an exam, check to see if you have a rectocele, if your uterus is prolapsing, because if you're going to do the surgery, you're gonna to need to take care of more than just the stress incontinence. You're gonna to need to do something about that uterus, most likely gonna to need to remove it. You're gonna to need to fix that rectocele, you're gonna to need to lift the bladder back up, and you're gonna to need to support the area underneath the bladder neck. So pelvic reconstructive surgery is usually done in conjunction. It's in part of the package of taking care of the stress urinary incontinence. Now, the other thing is, is that before you get surgery for stress incontinence, your surgeon is going to do what we call a CMG, a systemetrogram. And a CMG is a, write that down, CMG is a test where uh, it may be your nurse in your surgeon's office and they will do some testing where they're putting some tubes in your bladder. They put a little tube down in the rectum a short distance. They put some electrodes on the outside. And what they do is that they're monitoring pressures in your bladder, in your abdomen, seeing if when you cough, if you actually leak, they're looking to see how much your bladder drops down, they're looking to see what volume you have, they're looking to see if you have spasms while they're filling the bladder up. Because the interesting thing is, is that some people don't just have stress incontinence or overactive bladder, they have a combination of the two. That's what we call mixed incontinence. So your surgeon needs to know that because if you're having surgery for stress incontinence and you've got something else going on here, well, <laughs> obviously you're going to still have some problems after surgery. So he or she would like to know that before they do surgery because then they can say, you know what, I'm going to take care of your stress incontinence, but we're going to have to deal with this issue after your surgery. So the CMGs, there's a simple test that can be done and it takes about 15 minutes. And then there's what we call a complex systemetrogram. And that's where they do a lot more monitoring and they do a lot more measuring. Usually they have nurses that specialize in doing that. The doctor will have a special little urodynamics lab 
and it's really good information that they're getting. And I would suggest that if you're, you're going to have bladder surgery, that you go to somebody that does lots of bladder surgery, does complex systematogram, does a thorough evaluation, talks to you about the risk and the benefits, and what's going to happen afterwards if you start to have some bladder spasms. Now, on overactive bladder, how do we diagnose that? Well, first of all, the history. A lot of urgency, a lot of frequency, uh, knows where all the bathrooms are. Um, and then we look at, like we said, do a urinalysis. We check to see if there's any kidney stones. Sometimes we do an ultrasound where they ultrasound and look for stones. We get the history of prior surgery. We actually get an op report, take a look at that to see what kind of surgery you have. We assess when we do a pelvic exam if you have uh, low estrogen in the vaginal tissues. And then the last thing is, is that uh, we have you fill out some questionnaires that look for interstitial cystitis. There's a couple of questionnaires and then when I do your exam, I'm checking to see if that bladder's tender. If you've had prior surgery, it's usually not tender. Low estrogen might be a little bit tender, but if you have interstitial cystitis, it can be exquisitely tender when we do the exam. So once again, two types of incontinence, stress and overactive bladder. Some people can have a combination of those two. Thing is, is that it's pretty easy to diagnose on an, an exam in the office, and the treatment just going over the treatment, once again, the treatment for stress incontinence is usually going to be surgery. And traditionally, the surgery has kind of been the cornerstone. It's been uh, what we've done for, for years. Well, you know, and I'm just going to branch off here for just a second because I think this is really important, is that obviously there's some people that can't undergo surgery or they don't have insurance to undergo surgery and it's, it's fairly expensive. Uh, they may have medical conditions where they can't have the surgery or they choose they're afraid to have surgery for whatever reason. So what if there was a way to take care of the stress incontinence without having surgery? Well, there's a urogynecologist, Dr. Crawford, who did some studies. And so what he did is that they, he took a page out of the professional athletes book. Professional athletes will take electrodes and put on their muscle groups for their particular sport. They hook them up to a wireless uh, system and then it's put onto a computer. They get dressed in their spandex and then the athletes doing their exercise being videoed and then you've got a live uh, electronic monitoring of the muscles. So we're actually seeing those muscles as they contract. And you can see if maybe one of those muscles is not being contracted. So that athlete's gonna work on strengthening that muscle to help with their sport so that they can improve their performance. So what Dr. Crawford did is that he just took this to another level and he said, what if we put electrodes on the muscles that you help in your pelvic floor, you recruit to help you not leak urine when you cough or laugh or sneeze and doing those Kegel exercises. And it was as an ingenious idea. So what he did is we put two little electrodes on your, your, tr your transverse abdominis, your buttocks, inner thigh, and then we put two little electrodes right next to the opening to the vagina on the perineum. So we're testing the pelvic floor muscles, we have a connection there. We have a wireless hookup to your transverse abdominis, to your buttocks, and then to your inner thigh. So once you get dressed into your spandex, and then we have you go and we've got a video, high definition video that's filming you, at the same time, we have a Pilates instructor that is trained in what we call Pilates, which is, there's 10 Pilates exercises that will strengthen your pelvic floor. So out of all the Pilates exercises, of over 120 of them, there's 10 of them that really focus on strengthening your pelvic floor. And Dr. Crawford has, has named those Pilates, P-F-I-L-A-T-E-S. -P so he's taken Pilates instructors and they've been trained in these 10 exercises. So what we do is we wire you up, we then have uh, a computer and we're on this big huge screen so you're on this map with our Pilates instructor and uh, that Pilates instructor then is going to take you through the 10 exercises and at the beginning of each exercise it's really cool because what happens is that you're standing there looking at yourself being filmed but yet you can see and they'll ha we'll have you do a kegel and we'll say okay now do tighten those muscles do a kegel and we'll see a little blip in the screen and it kind of goes up then what we'll do is we'll do the first Pilates exercise. You'll do it two, three times. And then the instructor will have you throw in a kegel right in the middle of that Pilates exercise. 
and it's interesting, it's amazing. So your, your Kegel, you've gone up a little bit, and now all of a sudden, we may find the exercise and you just peg the meter. That means you've recruited your transverse abdominis, your buttocks, your inner thigh, everything comes together to have a great Kegel exercise. Well, what we do, out of those 10, we find which one is your strongest, which is your next strongest, your third, and your fourth. And guess what? If you learn those four exercises, your strongest ones, and you go home and you spend six minutes to eight minutes a day doing those four exercises on a regular basis, guess what the success rate? The success rate for doing those is about 80 to, to 85 percent success rate for stress incontinence. Well, that's the same as surgery without having the side effects of having an overactive bladder. So now you may say, well, that's going to be hard for me to do. Well, what we do in our office and what Dr. Crawford kind of pioneered is that if you're like me and like everybody else, it's hard to do exercises on your own. You either like to do them with an instructor, private session, or you may join a class. So we have a class. We have what we call a P Fitness Center. And so we have instructors and we have classes. So you come in and do those 10 exercises. It takes about 55 minutes and, and it's fun. They put music and those kind of things. So you can work on all of the exercises, including your four exercises. And so if you do that on a regular basis, or you can do them at home, or you can have private sessions, and you do them successfully, then you may not have to have surgery. And you may not have to have the problems associated with the side effects from that. The only side effects you're going to have from doing Pilates exercises is that your core is going to be stronger. You're going to have tighter abs, tighter buttocks, and tighter inner thighs. Well, I think most every lady would like to have that. So it's actually a win-win situation. You get rid of your stress incontinence, and you also avoid having surgery, and you have your, your core strengthens. The other thing is, it's, it's interesting. Ladies who have an overactive bladder, will have an improvement on their symptoms doing these Pilates exercises. So there's really not a whole lot of downside. And the thing is, is that the testing that we do for that is covered by insurance. And so that's a nice thing. Obviously the classes you have to pay for and in, in your area, um, you know, they may, it depends on, on your area and what they charge. But I have found in my practice, and, and Dr. Crawford's actually published it, I mean, it's been very successful. So I hope that you found that this information is helpful for you if you're having incontinence.